Hello, and welcome to The Palva Show. Today, my guest is Ryan LaVarnway. Ryan grew up in Woodland Hills, California. He played baseball at El Camino Real High School. After graduating from high school, he spent, attended Yale University, where he majored in philosophy and played baseball for the Bulldogs, setting the Ivy League record with 33 home runs and the longest hitting streak at 25 games. Ryan was originally drafted by the Boston Red Sox. Since making his major league debut in August of 2011, Ryan has played in parts of 10 major league baseball seasons for eight different teams and went on to become the 2013 World Series champion. Ryan has also served as a guest lecturer at elite institutions such as Harvard, UGA, Syracuse, Georgia State, and much more. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. So Ryan and I met at a speaking conference, essentially, uh, and we hit it off. And Ryan has an amazing story. So Ryan, I'll pass the mic over to you to share a little about how you got into baseball. Uh, how I got into baseball? Well, I was five years old and my kindergarten teacher said I was bad at sharing. So my parents <laughs> should get me involved in team sports. I don't know that that's a great story, but I share better now, I think. <laughs> I hope. Um, why don't you tell us a little about how you got into baseball and your baseball career in high school and uh, when it was time for you to play, what your coach said to you around like, well, why not you, Ryan? <laughs> no, sure. Absolutely. So I, I think I fell into the pattern, like a lot of people do, of just allowing momentum to direct my life. Uh, I was one of the better players on most of the Little League teams I played on. Maybe not the best ever, uh, but most of the time I was one of the better players in Little League. When I was getting ready to go to high school, my family moved into the district where the best baseball program was, which was great because I would get great coaching and hopefully great exposure because my goal was to make it to the major leagues. The problem with going to the best baseball school is there's the best competition and in order to make the varsity team and become a starter and actually play, you have to also be the best. So as a freshman in high school, I, I played on the freshman team. On the, as a sophomore, I played on the junior varsity team. And halfway through my junior year, I, I was playing varsity a little, but I also got benched. So I allowed the momentum of I wasn't the best player and there was better players around me, better players in my grade. I just allowed that to define my reality. And then going into my senior season, we were stretching on the blacktop above the baseball field. And my coach, his name is Matt LaCour, not the most warm and fuzzy guy in the world. He's walking around, kind of giving us the business. And he says, who's going to hit fourth for us this year? And I knew the answer was not me. Because the reality and the momentum of my high school baseball career so far told me that it wasn't me. And that was what I allowed to define my, my future also. So I looked around and Casey Green had a scholarship to Cal State Northridge. Sammy Donabedian had been on the varsity for two other years. Uh, Tyler Kolodny had started on the varsity as a freshman. Uh, who else? We had, we had five or six guys that were better than me. And if you don't know baseball, the best hitter hits fourth. But I was also a smart Alex 17 year old. So I said to my coach, Hey, why not me? And instead of, listing all those reasons why he knew I wouldn't be the best player and why I knew I wasn't going to be the best player. He just kind of cocked his head to the side, crossed his arms and said, why not you Ryan? And I think it's important to, to put a point on the word he emphasized in that three word question, because if he had said, why not you, that would have led to me listing all the reasons. Or if he had said, why not you? I might've self-defined what was wrong with me, but he put the emphasis on why not you. And mm. for me, that gave me permission to turn the question around and say, I'm going to make sure that it is me. And I think that most of your, you know, I don't know who your listener base is, but I think a lot of people listening, regardless of what walk of life they're in can relate to that because mm. it's so easy to go with the momentum and the flow of what's been happening and to fall into a social circle just based on who your neighbors are or who's the first person that talks to you at school or at work. It's, it's easy to define yourself by the role that someone gave you. Maybe it was the first opportunity and you didn't really strive for the best. But why not 
you? Why can't you accomplish what you want to? And when he asked me that question, it freed my mind to more possibilities. And that for whatever reason, him saying, why not you? It allowed me to expand my self-definition of what I could be and break out of the momentum of what I had fallen into. What an amazing coach where he reflects this question so gracefully back at you. Like, okay, Ryan, why not you? <laughs> and again, he, he wasn't a warm, fuzzy guy. I don't know if he knows that I look back on that as a pivotal turning point in my, in my life. He, he might've really meant like, why not you? Uh, but it, it was the way that I heard it that really changed things for me. And what did it change for you? What were the reasons that came up into your mind of like, well, why not me? Well, it was the only thing holding me back was, was my performance and my expectations of myself. I had set the, even, even unconsciously, I had set a limit on how good I could be based on how good I was before that moment. And I had, I had set a limit on what my role on the team could be or, or how good I could be based on the momentum that had happened so far. And instead I went from having been benched for half of the season as a junior to I'm going to be the best I can possibly be. And I'm going to be so good that he can't ignore me. He can't bench me. He needs me on the field. And by the end of that season, I was batting fourth every day and I ended up hitting 482 with eight homers, which if you know anything about baseball stats is that's above average. And I was, I was named all conference and I got the chance to play in college and keep my career going. Whereas if I had kept the same momentum and ended up being benched, that year might've been the last year of my baseball career. Wow. And it seems like this one limiting belief when that limit was literally just taken away or even changed, like the ceiling was changed. It completely changed the way you began to show up in life. In fact, we see this like throughout history as well. For example, the four minute mile, like for the longest time, we as humans believed it just wasn't possible. And then one day someone broke the four minute mile and literally that same week, all around the world, people started breaking that record. Yeah, why because, not? Yeah, because we started believing it was now possible. That's exactly right. Your your mind is so powerful to either limit you and keep you where you are or allow you to get to the next step, whatever the next step is, even if you can't see the next step. Mm. I love that because what you're talking about is having a little faith along the way. And just believing that you got this. And, and so the next step of my baseball career, the next why not question that that changed my momentum and changed my life was a year later, after my freshman year baseball season at, at Yale, I saw our first baseman get awarded the first team all Ivy League award. And I, I looked to my hitting coach, Glenn Lungarini, and I said, I didn't know they did that. I want to win that award. Right. Like, uh, you know, you see someone on your team have a great season and be rewarded with recognition. I want to have that, too. And my hitting coach looked at me who I had just hit 296 for the for the season. I think I hit maybe six home runs. Nothing special. Very average player. I had I had had a stress fracture in my leg. I didn't stand out. And in, instead of giving me the reasons why I shouldn't win all Ivy or just saying, yeah, yeah, sure. That sounds good. He said, why not more? Mm -hmm. Why would you stop at all Ivy league? If you're not all American, by the time you graduate, you're not living up to your potential. And mm -hmm. my mind just exploded with a possibility because yes, I knew that all American was an award that existed out there in the world, but not in relation to me. I had never considered that or or strove to earn that award. But when he's, he said he believed in me and he said he thinks I was good enough, that opened up a new level. It unlocked the the boss, right? It, like if you're playing video games, it unlocked the, the big guy. And mm -hmm. it planted a seed in my head. And from that moment on, that was my new goal. I had I had just expressed a small goal and he said, how about this bigger one that's way farther away and way harder to get? And the very next year, 
after having that mentality every day, I woke up in the morning, you know, I went to the gym, everything I ate, everything I did, I was an all American the next year. I led the country in batting average and slugging percentage. I broke all sorts of records because he put a bigger carrot in front of me than the small goal mm-hmm. that I was going to try to go for. It also seems like you were open to receiving that message because there are many individuals would perhaps see that and be like, oh, well, I can list a million reasons as to why not. Um, but I want to I want to back up a little here because you talk about oh, my freshman year year at Yale, so nonchalantly. (laughs) I think it's important to note that that was a pretty big accomplishment in itself that you didn't just have all of these like breakthroughs when it came to baseball or your professional career, but also in this academic realm where you made it to one of the best institutions in the entire world. So it's almost as if there's your capacity to believe that the options were limitless were just completely open. How is it that you got to Yale? Like what was the transition from high school to Yale um, and then carrying on baseball baseball at this Ivy League institution? Have you ever wanted a new car? Oh yeah, for sure. (laughs) So so what what was your dream car or what was the last car you purchased? Okay, so... same question I th- or same answer because my dream car was the last my last car purchase yeah. uh, it was a nissan 370z <laughs> okay what color is it it's black okay so when you decided that was the car you wanted before you bought it how many of those cars did you see on the road so many i remember freshman year of college i saw an orange one and i was so like many. that is gonna be my car one day so many <laughs> right and if if, if there's a couple that's trying to, to have kids, right? And maybe they're having a hard time, but when that's in your brain, what's the thing that you see all the time? You see yeah, everybody that's... with kids and that's the mm. thing you notice. So there's, there's a confirmation bias. Mm. There's real science behind this. You just start to notice it's, there's too many stimulations in the world for you to focus on all of them. So the thing that's programmed into your brain is the thing you notice. If you can use that to your advantage, and you're looking for things to confirm that you are capable or that you are talented or that you have the ability or that you can accomplish your dreams. You just hacked your brain and hacked your life. Mm. So set a big goal, set something that seems outrageous. But if you can trick yourself into saying, that's not outrageous. I just took a step towards that goal right now. You start to feel the wind. You start to feel the momentum. So when I, wanted to be an all-american i would go into the batting cage and i would think to myself how would an all-american hit this ball right now how would an all-american take this swing just this one swing right now that takes less than half a second and i hit the ball really well that's right i just did that like an all-american next swing and you take 100 swings a day in the cage when no one's around and you feel like an all-american for 80 of those 100 swings And the 20 that didn't go well, you either focus on those 20 or you disregard those because you're not perfect. But the 80 that you did well, that's the confirmation that I, that I have this, that I'm capable of this, which do you focus on? And no matter what walk of life you're in, you can, you can use this to your advantage because confirmation, confirmation bias is real. And if Mm. you, if you have a goal, Whatever your next goal is, figure out the first next step to get there or focus on the minutia of what a person who's accomplished that goal, what do they do? Can you do that small little thing? Good. You're that much closer. Mm, Okay. Multiple things come up in me when you talk about this particular experience. So there is two books. One is called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, where he talks about envisioning exactly what it is you want. And then this book called Feeling is a Secret by Neville Goddard, where he talks about you have to really feel it as if it's already here. And when you combine the two, it seems like you combine these two aspects where you envisioned what you wanted. And then what you said, like that felt like an all-American, that you like, you really embodied it. And it was this thing that you needed to do, that I need to gain this accomplishment 
and it, these are the things that I need to do to get along the way. But it sounds like what you really did was shift into from doing to being because we're we're human beings, not human doings. And so it's oh. almost as yeah, it's yeah, almost. Uh, as, I was Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> it's almost as if that, like, you know, there was these were the tasks you had to do, but in order to do these tasks, you really ask yourself, who do I need to be in order to achieve these goals? And part of who you needed to be was focused and disciplined and not someone that was like unsure of themselves. There was there's a duality in your mind that needs to exist, or at least for me. Hmm. And it's you have the big goal. And you focus on the big goal, but you also mm. understand the individual small steps along the way and be present in those small steps with the big picture in mind. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because, because getting awarded the all American plaque right there behind me took a year. It took a whole year. Wow. It took a full season. We played 40 some odd games. During the spring, we played 20 some odd games over the fall, 40 something, you know, 100 baseball games over the course of a year from setting the goal to achieving the goal. In baseball, it's a three hour game. When you are hitting, because that's, that's my strength, that's why I was an All American, because of, of my hitting, not my defense. You get four at bats, maybe five a day. And ultimately, you put one of those pitches in play. There is less than a third of a second of reaction time from the time the pitcher releases the ball till you need to make contact with that pitch. Mm -hmm. So over the course of having this big goal for a year, I needed to focus during a third of a second at a time. You have to have the duality of keep the big picture in mind, be that person, live that goal but focus in the moment hmm. i love that i love that because yeah it's not just about chasing this goal it's also about enjoying that process and being present in the process along the way otherwise that journey like you miss it you have you have to do the little things you can't you can't try to do the big one full year step you have to hmm. take care of every third of a second along the way Okay, so that was your college career. So then you transition into Major League Baseball and get drafted by the Boston Red Sox. Tell me how that moment felt for you after having worked so hard to get there throughout this process. So I drafted by the Red Sox in the sixth round. For me, it felt like the next logical step. I had, I had earned it. Mm -hmm. And it, it was something I had always looked forward to, but it was also just the next step because I wanted to make it to the major leagues. And when you get drafted, you don't go straight to the bigs. You have to go to the minors. It's like high school levels all over again, just like mm -hmm. there's the freshman team, the sophomore team, the JV, then the varsity. The major leagues is the varsity team. But there's six levels underneath that as a pro. Even if you get pro, you still have six levels to get to, get to the major leagues. Mm -hmm. So as I got drafted... I kept my why not me and why not more mantras going strong. I saw somebody get awarded minor league player of the year. I want to win that. So I did two years in a row. You take care of the big goal, take care of the little things along the way. I got to the big leagues three years later, right? The big goal is three years away. Eight days later, after playing well, eight days later, I get sent back down to the minor leagues. I accomplished my dream. I played well. But then out of my control, future Hall of Famer David Ortiz is healthy. They don't need me anymore. So I got sent back down. Hmm. It's almost like it's almost like getting fired from your dream job. But then you hope they'll hire you again. Which they did. And they got fired again. And then they got hired again and fired again. Twenty over the last twelve years. I got called up and sent down or traded or released 26 times. Wow. Wow. That's some serious capacity <laughs> to be able to keep going, keep going. Because like there are 
many of us, myself included, where when things hit us hard over and over and over again, it can be so easy to believe, maybe I'm just not meant for this. But you're like, no, it's like that. Why not me? <laughs> yeah, there, there's something there's something in me that got really good at not quitting. Mm. Um, I, I I call it the the F7 matrix. And this is this is something I've looked back on and and kind of put together after the fact, but they're tools that I used along the way without even recognizing I was using them. Uh, connecting with my purpose and under, understanding what motivated me. And for me, I always felt like there was still more good baseball left in me. I always thought I could get back. I always thought I could play better. I always thought I could stick around for longer. And if I didn't think I could do more, if I didn't think I could be better, there's no way I would, I would have kept going. I call that connecting with your fire. Hmm. What, what's your purpose? What's your why? You've heard this before. This is just another way of saying something you've heard before. What's your why? What's your fire? That's, that's the first F. The second F is, is your family. And I don't mean your mother, father, sister, brother, auntie, uncle. I mean your support system, your chosen family. Who's going to cheer you on no matter what? Because I think you need a cheerleader. And with that, who's going to call you on your, on your crap? You need, a, you need a bullshit meter. You need someone to, to push you to take risks. You need a gambler in your life. And you also need an analyst, somebody to help you analyze those risks. Make sure you're taking smart risks only. And you, you need a peer or a teammate that's going through the same thing as you at the same time. And you need a coach or a mentor, somebody that's been there before, knows how to get there, help you avoid the landmines. So understand who your, your chosen family is and then go in fully. Don't, don't half ass it. Don't dip your toe in the pool. Dive in because you're never going to be as good as you possibly can. You're never going to see all the benefits unless you give it everything you got. Fight. Fight every day. Anything worth doing is going to be difficult. It's going to take a while. The duality of mind that I talked about, understand your big goal, but in the moment, you need to fight every single day towards that mm -hmm. goal. And then the, the final three Fs came from a teammate, a, a leader on the Boston Red Sox World Series team that you alluded to earlier. And this is, this is one of my favorite stories from my career. He, we were getting ready for the playoffs in 2013, and he called a team meeting. Nobody knew who called the team meeting. We thought it was the coaches. But he walks in, naked as the day he was born, knee-high socks, jock strap handle a whiskey in his hand and he said we're going to win the world series because of the three f's and this is this is why i've created the, the f7 matrix because i look back at all those all those other skills and i think it's not an accident he chose the letter f there's 5055 words in the english language that start with f hmm. and how many times have you thought when you're exasperated that you you don't have any f's left to give hmm. let me tell you you do Give, the, give all the Fs you got. Fundamentals, foul tips, and four run homers. Those are the three Fs he said that day. Fundamentals make sense in any field. Every field has their own fundamentals, the things you need to do to be successful. Foul tips is something that's a specific baseball term, but it has a greater meaning. How are you going to take advantage of the other team just missing? Your competitor just missing. How are you going to get that slight edge that puts you over the top? Mm. And then four run homers was the third F he said. And if you know anything about baseball, that's not what a four run homer is called. It's called a grand slam. But in redefining the language, he gave us a shared goal, a shared vision of how we would be successful. And I did the research on this. There's been 118 world series played 71 of them had no four-run homers hit. The remaining 30-plus, it's a 51-49% split of the team that hit the Grand Slam, won or lost. So there's no data to support this. But when this leader on our team said we were going to win because of four-run homers, and then in the eighth inning against the Detroit Tigers, David Ortiz, the guy that had me sent down to the, to the minors for the first time, 
gets up there and hits a four run homer, he hits a grand slam. We knew we were going to win in that moment. He tied the game, didn't give us the lead. We were losing the series, not winning. But we had the shared vision of success in the shared language. And in that moment, we knew. So whatever walk of life you're in, once again, how can you have a shared vision of success? How can you come up with a shared language for how you're going to be successful? What a great question. Um, what's becoming evident throughout your story is you started this off with, I asked you to share your journey. You're like, well, I wasn't really good at team sports or playing with the team and now I'm really good at it. And yeah, I mean, your entire journey shows how being part of a team, having a support network, which is a team, having a shared vision, which happens within a team, literally changed your life and helped you evolve into this person who is now asking us these very insightful questions because these are the kinds of questions when we reflect on ourselves that allow us to move forward rather than staying stagnant. Exactly. And I've played team sports for 30 out of the 35 years of my life and it has totally shaped who I am as a person. Mm. What do you think has been your biggest learning about yourself throughout your journey so far? Failing. <laughs> I've, I've, HFs now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the HF. Um, I have failed as much as anybody in my life. Not only getting sent down from the majors 26 times. You know, you talk about Michael. Michael Jordan said he, you know, he he made the shots because he missed the shots, and when Gretzky missed 300 shots, whatever. I've struck out over 900 times in my life. But Babe Ruth, my favorite player of all time, said, every strikeout brings me closer to my next home run. Mm. You take the failures, you take the strikeouts as a step on the journey. You can't hit a home run every time. You can't win every sales pitch. You can't get every new client. But can you learn from every step of the, along the way? It sounds like you definitely learned every step along the way. Uh, not every step, but I tried to <laughs> try to learn from most of them. <laughs> I love it. Um, you said something to me that really stuck out, uh, that realistic expectations are limitations. Can you expand on that? It's it's that's that's what I am I'm getting at with the why not me story that really mm. set me off. That was the first turning point in my life and my career in high school. Realistically, I was not the best player on that team. Realistically, I shouldn't have been batting fourth. Realistically, I never should have made it to the major leagues or played in the Olympics. But if you stick with what's realistic, you'll never be able to do anything great. How can mm. you expand your expectations beyond what's realistic and with that believe it's possible yeah i am the example of the exception let me be someone that you can relate to i i'm very honest about i'm the slowest runner on the planet <laughs> i have a very average throwing arm i'm not very good at defense i have one skill that i did very well and that was hit and I was able to play in the major leagues, the best league in the world, for 10 years. I got to the Olympics as an unathletic athlete. Mm. That's not realistic. So don't let realistic outcomes limit you in whatever walk of life you're in. Mm. So this is very interesting because there's a lot of evidence throughout history showing this as well, that if we didn't believe that flying was possible, we wouldn't have airplanes taking us all around the world today. Or if we didn't believe it was possible to harness fire in a glass dome, we wouldn't have light bulbs, essentially. Um, and I know Simon Sinek also talks about this, how the Wright brothers, realistically, it was impossible for them to accomplish what they did because they didn't have the backing, they didn't have the um, financial support, whereas a direct competitor of theirs did. And yet somehow 
they still accomplished in figuring out flight. Um, and it's partly because of belief that so much of believing in themselves and believing that this was possible and having these unrealistic, unrealistic quotes, <laughs> expectations was what allowed them to surpass beyond what anyone else expected of them. Yeah. Be unrealistic. I love it. Is that your advice for the listeners to be unrealistic? <laughs> Uh, yes and no, because I think you need to believe that it's realistic, mm. whether anyone believes you or not. There are six to 8 million high school baseball players across the country every year. 7% of them get to play in college. Of those 7%, 4% will get drafted to play pro. Of that 4% of the 7%, 50% of those will make it to the major leagues for one day. Of those 50% of 4% of 7%, 50% will play more than one year. So if you go, to go talk to a youth baseball player and told them 99.7% chance you never play in the big leagues and you never play for more than a year, is that a chance you would take? Is that realistic? 99.7% chance against you. Mm. But from the time I was five years old, I knew that was going to be me. Realistic or not, I knew. So know that what is unrealistic for someone else is your destiny. Mm. So that's so interesting that you're right. When we begin to take logic into account and we'll crunch the numbers and like, oh, well, the probabilities of me succeeding in this particular path are slim to none. So let me just do something I'm more likely to succeed at. We're just, we're limiting ourselves. I think, you know, many times, and the many of my listeners know my story, but many times along my journey, whenever I've shared my story, so, a lot of people have said to me, wow, you're really lucky to have run away, been homeless, and then still succeed. It's like that wasn't ever not succeeding was never an option. For it wasn't me. even on the table. It wasn't even on the table. Failure was not an option. In fact, Harvard was the goal and I made it there. That was it. Like I felt it. I tasted it even while I was sleeping on park benches that like th those limitations were weren't even in my mind. Like, oh, what if I don't? It was always I'm going to. There's just no other option. Yeah, I, I have a podcast of my own and it's called Finding the Way. Mm -hmm. And part of it is a play on my last name, Ryan LaVarnway. Huh. Yeah, but part of it is <laughs> a saying in, uh, in baseball is whatever you got to do, find a way. Whatever your goal in life is, find a way. There, there is a way where there's a will, there's a way. Find it. Mm. That's so interesting. Yeah, because if there is a goal and we want it bad enough, we'll find a way. And if there's like no pathway there, we'll just we'll carve it along the way. Yep. But if we tell ourselves, oh, there's no pathway and carving it is not an option, then we'll start taking paths that like others have already walked down. And then we'll eventually find ourselves at this end goal that was never initially our goal to begin with and then we reflect asking ourselves how did i get here and why am i doing what i'm doing first step is take responsibility and take ownership of where you are now understand that you're there because of the choices you made whether you meant to or not hmm. and then start making conscious choices towards your purpose your fire hmm Right. What you just said, that's not the easiest thing to do because that requires the ego to admit to itself that it had a that you had a role to play in where you've ended up versus blaming the world, being like, well, no, it's it's not my fault. Everything was out of my control, which is not necessarily true. Part of the process of pivoting and actually taking control control of our lives, I think, yeah, you're right. The first step is taking that responsibility and realizing, you know what? Actually, there were decisions I consciously made that have led me to this point. Exactly. So for those of us who are trying to strive for big goals and 
unrealistic dreams, what advice do you have for us? Believe in the power of possibility. Doesn't matter if anyone believes in it with you. Hmm. And also, also find someone that's done it. Hmm. People are, people are willing to help. People want to help. Find your cheerleader, right? You need the chosen family that I, that I spoke about. Everybody needs a cheerleader. Everybody needs a mentor that's been there and done that. And if you're trying to do something that nobody else has ever done before, find somebody that got close. They know the lessons and the pitfalls, but you have to believe it's possible before you can do anything. That's, that's great advice. Even when I venture out into trying something new, um, I'll interview at least three people who have done it before so that I can gauge like, all right, well, what exactly is the process and the journey? Because yes, the goal may look sparkly, but if the journey or the process is something that I'll hate along the way, is the goal really worth it? Exactly. Well, the sacrifices along the way will be worth it if you do something that you're truly passionate about. Hmm. Well, Ryan, if people want to find out more about what you're doing, where can they find you? Oh boy, check out my website, ryanlevarnway.com. Uh, follow me on Instagram, rlevarnway, or Twitter, at ryanlevarnway. Got a, got a lot of things in the works. Excited to share them with the world. All right. And I will uh, add all of this to the show notes as well. Um, and you mentioned your podcast, so I will create the link for that as well. Um, Perfect. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on my show. Of course. Thanks for having me.